Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another webinar in Con Maciel Carey's two webinar series. Today is the collision of the OSHA webinar series and the Labor and Employment webinar series. It's the seventh in both uh, sets of webinars, but the, we have a, a really interesting overlapping topic. So we're together today uh, talking about uh, joint and multi-employer, independent contractor, temporary worker, and uh, and how those issues uh, impact labor and employment law and OSHA. And I'm delighted uh, uh, today to be joined by my colleagues uh, from both of our um, uh, uh, practice areas here at Con Masio Carey. Uh, the voice you're hearing now is uh, Eric Kahn. I'm one of the uh, founding partners of Con Masio Carey, and I chair the firm's National OSHA and Workplace Safety Practice Group. Uh, my practice for the last 17 years has focused uh, almost exclusively in uh, areas of workplace safety and health law. Primarily, that means working with employers in their dealings with federal OSHA and the state OSHA programs around the country, but also uh, working with other state and federal agencies where they get their fingers involved in safety and health issues as well, the Chemical Safety Board, EPA, MSHA, and others. Uh, I work with employers to develop, audit, and implement their safety and health programs but also reactively when there's uh, inspections and investigations by OSHA and other agencies, as well as enforcement actions. And in that context, uh, I handle the full range of litigation um, uh, against uh, OSHA and the state OSH programs, including uh, criminal prosecutions and appeals of uh, civil citations as well. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by my partner, Jordan Schwartz, in the labor and employment practice and one of our associates, Lindsay DeSalvo, uh, who supports both practice areas, the OSHA and Labor and Employment. I'll have them introduce themselves and let Jordan kick off the discussion today. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, for those of you who I haven't spoken to before, uh, my name is Jordan Schwartz, and as Eric said, I'm a partner in the Labor and Employment uh, Practice Group here. And in that capacity, uh, my practice really encompasses a few things. First, I defend employers in litigation, uh, both the federal and state levels, and really on the whole you know, penalty of, of acronym uh, statutes under, under the ADA, the FLSA, the FMLA, Title VII, um, and really all discrimination, anti-discrimination statutes. I also counsel employers on compliance with these federal laws and also any applicable state laws, um, and some of those issues relate to uh, hiring, firing, uh, severance agreements, uh, restrictive covenants, and, and really anything in the counseling realm. Um, and I also advise unionized and non-unionized workplaces regarding uh, employers' rights under the National Labor Relations Act. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Lindsay DeSalvo. I am an associate at Con Maciel Carey in both the OSHA and the Labor and Employment Practices. Uh, in that role, I represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, including wage hour issues and other topics under the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, which we will talk a little bit about today. And then um, I also review and revise employer policies, procedures, and employee handbooks, um, as well as representing employers during OSHA inspections and investigations. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jordan to kick us off. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, so the agenda for today is first, we're going to focus more on the employment law side and perspective of things. I'm going to talk about the quote unquote new joint employer standard, which uh, as you'll see is both a, it's kind of a combination of a new standard and an old standard. And I'll explain that as I go. Uh, then Lindsay will take over and talk about independent contractor issues and importantly how as an employer you need to make sure to avoid potential misclassification uh, of independent contractors. Uh, and then Eric and Lindsay will both talk about the OSHA side of this presentation, uh, both regarding OSHA's temporary worker initiative and OSHA's multi-employer worksite enforcement. Um, and there is the chat 
box on the bottom lower left-hand corner. So for all questions, just feel free to type away and ask any questions you have, and either during or after the presentation, one of us will attempt to answer you. And if somehow uh, there's just too many questions and we can't get to all of them, you can always, we'll provide our um, contact information at the end, and you can always send us a question, and we'll be happy to, to answer you um, soon after the presentation is over. Um, also, in case you, you don't all know, your lines are muted and this presentation is being recorded. So with that being said, let, let's talk about this uh, new joint employer standard and what really implications are for this whole joint employment issue. Um, as many of you are, are likely aware, typically it, it makes a lot of business sense um, and it's a, you know, it, it's often just a, a smart business practice to use a staffing firm or a contractor to outsource uh, some tasks for whatever your business requires. You know, often that's a great way to fill gaps in the workforce uh, without the hassle of hiring a full-time employee. But when doing that, often questions arise, and, and one such question is, you know, who is the rightful employer of these outside workers? Is it the third party firm or is it the company that hires them? Or perhaps is it both? Uh, another way to think about this issue is when two or more associated companies employ the same staff members and have control over the tasks and the employment conditions of those workers, are both companies considered joint employers? Um, and that's really the joint employer question we'll be discussing today. I, I see a few people have already asked um, if the presentation will be emailed. And, and yes, uh, as a follow-up to the presentation, we will send um, an email with a link to the recording of this presentation uh, as well as the slides. Um, so as, as joint employers, both companies potentially will have legal obligations to their shared employees. And those obligations could range from entering into contracts, such as collective bargaining agreements, resolving disputes, uh, potentially needing to resolve work stoppages and or if strikes occur, and renegotiating contracts. And importantly, if you as the employer do not honor these obligations uh, as a joint employer, even if you are not even aware of them, it's possible that your company could be found to be in violation of various laws. And I, I've listed the potential, um, the most likely laws that you would found to be violative, violating as a joint employer. And that would either be the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, um, or the Fair Labor Standards Act, potentially uh, discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, there are also numerous state-specific employment laws uh, that I won't get into too much today, although I'll, I'll touch on California in, in a minute. And of course, also uh, OSHA um, could be a potential, um, it could be implicated and you could be potentially violating uh, the OSH Act. So you need to keep in mind that there are various laws that, that you could get into trouble here. So it's not just, it's not just the NLRA. So in the employment context, um, joint responsibility has kind of developed from, from case law under most, most notably the National Labor Relations Board. In 2014, uh, the NLRB expanded the definition of joint employer to include a company's use of a contractor if the company exercises direct or indirect control over essential terms and conditions of employment. Um, and what that stemmed for was a case called CNN America Inc. in which the board held that two entities will be considered joint employers when they share or co-determine those matters governing the essential terms and conditions of employment and the putative joint employer meaningly affects the matters relating to the employment relationship, such as hiring, firing, discipline, supervision, and direct direction. So this was really the first decision that was starting to 
expand the definition to both direct and indirect control. And this continues to this day. I'll certainly get to the Brown and Ferris decision in a few minutes that took this definition and expanded it even more. And, and, and even right now, the NLRB is still in the process of determining um, under uh, the McDonald's case and a few other cases whether franchisors are joint employers with franchisees. Currently, that's a relationship that the NLRB has consistently held not to be in a joint employer relationship in most circumstances. But um, this is an ever-developing area of the law, and, and it's you know, still kind of a wait-and-see approach to see what will happen in, in, in that case. Um, but as I mentioned, beyond federal agencies, some states have also taken the liberty of broadening the joint employer relationship. Uh, for example, uh, in the past, workers in California were only able to establish liability against the company by showing that an actual employment relationship existed both with the labor contractor that employed the temporary worker and with the company uh, to which the worker was assigned to perform contracted services. And a worker usually did this by showing that the company to which he or she was assigned exercised significant direct control over his hours, wages, or working conditions. But with this new, new law in California as of uh, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, uh, this direct control showing is now not necessary for certain violations. Um, so for all those on, on this webinar here from California, you, know, you need to know that an employer may now be deemed liable with a third-party contractor um, who actually hires and controls the temporary workers, no matter what the extent of actual control the company exerts over these temporary workers or contract workers. So, for, for example, um, the employer can now be liable for issues related to payment of wages even if they have no control over the participation in the payment of wages to a temporary worker hired by a contractor. So it's just something really this indirect control um, is, is something you really need to keep in mind. But now let, let's get into the, the dichotomy between the old standard and the new standard. So the old joint employment standard, this means the standard really before the Obama administration. Uh, what was historically the quote-unquote traditional standard. And what the standard was at that point was that entities were joint employers if they shared the ability to control or co-determine matters governing essential terms and conditions of employment, such as hiring, firing, discipline, wages, supervision, and direction. And notably, the control had to be actual, direct, and substantial, not simply theoretical or possible. So the, the, really the relevant inquiry was whether your company exerted significant and a direct degree of control over a worker. And the reason this is so important is this isn't just a theoret theoretical discussion of what was the old standard. This now may end up becoming be becoming the new standard. So it's really important that you are at least aware of what this standard was and so you know about it um, with the trend we're seeing of the standard likely moving back uh, to, to this way of thinking. However, it is not there yet and that is something that some, some of our clients are confused about and that's one of the reasons we're doing the um, presentation today. So just keep in mind for now that this is the old standard. However, um, in 2015, there was really a cutting-edge decision from the, from the board called Browning-Ferris. And the, the quick relevant facts of that case are, are that Browning-Ferris is a, uh, it's a California-based recycling facility, and it used temporary workers from a company called LeadPoint. And LeadPoint employees perform different tasks than Browning Ferris's employees. Um, and they were actually supervised, hired, and fired, not by Browning Ferris supervisors, but by on-site LeadPoint management and HR representatives of LeadPoint. But 
because Brown and Ferris subjected lead points hiring decisions to its own criteria and because it reserved the right to dismiss these temporary workers, the NLRB found that the two companies were in fact joint employers. So kind of based on that factual background, uh, the Browning Ferris expanded the joint employer test um, and, and held that two entities are now joint employers under the National Labor Relations Act if one, there is a common law employment relationship with the employees in question, and two, the punitive joint employer possesses, possesses sufficient control over employees' essential terms and conditions of employment to permit meaningful bargaining. And, and I'll expl uh, explain a little more in these next few slides what exactly that means. Um, essentially, the, the board had a long discussion about actual versus potential control. And, and they made a, a little, they were a little too wordy with this uh, first quote here, but it is important. So I wanted to cut and paste it and, and then read it here, where it says, uh, the board says, we will no longer require that a joint employer not only possess the authority to control employees' terms and conditions of employment, but also exercise that authority. And, and here is the kicker, the sec second clause here. Reserved authority to control terms and conditions of employment, even if not exercised, is clearly relevant to the joint employment inquiry. So again, just to reiterate that, reserved authority, if you have the ability to do something, even if you don't exercise that ability, that is what the board found to be the most relevant inquiry, inquiry to the joint employment question. The board also stated that nor will we require that to be relevant to the joint employer inquiry, a statutory employer's control must be exercised directly and immediately. If otherwise sufficient, control exercised indirectly, such as through an intermediary, may establish joint employer status. And that's kind of why I uh, summarized the facts of, of Brown and Ferris. In that case, um, Brown and Ferris didn't do anything directly, but they did go through an intermediary. They did go through lead points uh, management and provide their own hiring criteria. Um, so by that indirect control, joint employer status was found to be applicable uh, by the board. So, under this new joint employer test as of 2015, and this is still currently the law, and I will repeat this a few more times, um, that this law has not been reversed or, or, or changed in, in any way. Um, an employer can may or potentially will be deemed a joint employer under the NLRA if one, it does not actually exercise any control over employees' terms and conditions of employment, but potentially based on a contract or otherwise, theoretically could exercise such control at some point, or two, it does not directly exercise any control, but rather exercises control through a third party. So this, this joint employer standard um, should have caused you as an employer, or if it hasn't yet, it still should cause you as an employer, to review your contracts and relationships with your staff and companies and outsourcing partners to potentially identify and assess legal risks um, through a joint employer relationship and to potentially take immediate action to mitigate or eliminate those risks. Uh, for example, for outsourcing relationships, in order to avoid a joint employment finding, uh, you may want to focus on ensuring that you don't interfere with the hiring and firing of the third party's employees, like Brown and Ferris did. As long as the contractor doesn't violate laws, you really, a a as the actual employer, shouldn't be concerned as to which employees they hire and fire. Um, and with staffing workers, you, you want to be ensured they have a clearly delineated, they have clearly delineated functions that they'll be performing, and that their length of their job is clearly delineated, and 
to not get into an independent contractor um, difficulty, uh, more, more likely than not, the staff and firm workers should be working for a relatively short and defined period of time, not a long and undefined period of time. Also, last year, uh, the, an another um, decision came out called Miller and Anderson. And it's interesting, this came out exactly a year ago, July 11th, 2016, um, in which the board reversed a decades-old precedent requiring the consent of both the host employer and the staffing agency for temporary employees to join regular employees in a bargaining unit. So uh, to summarize, the holding was that temporary employees may form a bargaining unit with regular employees without employer approval if they share a community of interest. Um, and obviously that, that, that's a little bit of a problem because now you might have multiple employers, at least two if not more, who all have to engage in potential uh, bargaining with, with a potential uh, union. And that means lots of employers would be participating in this bargaining process with little or no relationship to many of the bargaining unit employees. So the impact of this is that it bolsters the impact of Brown and Ferris by making it easier for temporary employees to unionize. Really, you know, if you look at it, Brown and Ferris made it easier for a company to be considered a joint employer. And now this Miller and Anderson uh, decision makes it easier to unionize once a joint employer relationship has been established. Uh, just to answer one question I just got about background and security check standards and drug and alcohol tests, I mean, that's a really tricky issue. Um, hopefully, you, you may be able to have a, a third-party company who can take care of that for you. But if you are establishing the standards uh, and specifically deciding whether or not to hire employees based on their passing um, some type of drug and alcohol test, or if you are involved in their termination, if they fail such a test, um, that's a strong likelihood that at least as of the law you know, on July 11, 2017, you could be found to be a joint employer. And we can talk more about different strategies you know, um, offline about what you can do to try, try to avoid this. But really, that's the type of involvement that the board ha has said, you know, implicates you as, as a joint employer for this, um, you know, for, for potential li liability. Now, let, let me move on a little bit here because I don't want to take too much time away from Eric and, and Lindsay. I'm already going a little long. But where, where all of this gets a little confusing is that last year, the Department of Labor issued a memorandum uh, supporting what was called an economic realities test for determining uh, joint employer status under the FLSA. And the test examines whether a worker is economically dependent on, on the purported employer. It is not only concerned with control. Again, the, the test um, typically used to be con, uh, only focused on control, and, and, and then the DOL wanted it to be more involved in, in, in other factors, and they issued this memorandum kind of explaining um, their position that the joint employment, like employment generally, like independent contractors, should be defined expansively under, under the FLSA. And uh, you know, the DOL was criticized a little bit for creating what was known to be informal standards outside of the notice and comment uh, process that's typically required for formal agency rulemaking. Um, so, so keep that in mind uh, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this memo again in, in, in a minute. But it didn't have, notably, the, the memo doesn't have the weight of the law. Really what the memo does is show what the current administration's position 
um, in this area of the law is and show any shift that's occurred from a prior administration and show how it may be leaning if it were to take enforcement actions going forward in the future. And just real quickly, the economic realities factors, I, I, I have a slide here that, that it lists all of them. In addition to the first two, which are direct control and supervision and the control of employment conditions, it talks more about you know, whether an employee is economically dependent on the employer. Is there a permanency and duration of the relationship? Or is the, employer, is the employee working for multiple different companies? Uh, is the work integral to the business? Is it repetitive? Uh, it, it's just a lot of factors that you need to analyze to decide whether or not um, an employee meets this economic uh, realities test. Uh, notably, just as an aside, um, under Title VII, from my review of the case law, courts assess kind of some more a form of the control test. Um, as opposed to the economic reality. So in terms of a discrimination lawsuit, courts are looking more uh, for uh, as of the issues of authority to hire and fire or control over payments and records and day-to-day -day supervision of employees more than um, the economic realities test. And now this next slide I have titled Joint Employment Fair Labor Standards Act Take Two. And that is because just last month, the new Secretary of Labor, Secretary Acosta, has just announced the withdrawal of the DOL's previous memo on the joint employer standard. Um, notably, while the, and I've written here AI, that, that's another word for the memo, it's called the administrator interpretation. While the memo's rescission is being hailed by the employer community, it's really just the first step in clarifying the new administration's position on this issue. Um, it really can be seen as the first in a series of steps the agency might take to kind of steer the DOL away from the fissured workplace theory advocated by the former wage and hour director to what I've, I've referenced as the more traditional view of employment relationships. Um, so uh, under this view, um, and Acosta has specifically um, stated this during his, during his confirmation hearing, um, the, the preferred view would be the direct and immediate control standard, uh, you know, the, the traditional factors in making this assessment versus the unexercised control standard that Browning Ferris has set forth. Um, but Keep in mind that the DOL has emphasized that the rescission of this memorandum does not change legal responsibilities of employers under the FLSA. Um, so it does not change the Browning-Ferris case. It does not reverse it. It does not change the law. And, and this is what I really want you to be aware of. It shows that the new administration is, is leaning the other way and um, in, in regards to that, you know, there, there's some new potential legislation uh, uh, in the back burner. One, Republicans are making a push to include a one-year hold on uh, the joint employer standard in appropriations legislation, but that would require 60 senators to avoid a filibuster, and it's unlikely that any Democrat would support, support that. So I, I would think reversal of Brown and Ferris would be much more likely. Um, there's also a meeting in the, um, subcom in the Education and Workforce, the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, there's a meeting tomorrow discussing re redefining joint employer standards, barriers to job creation, and entrepreneurship. And what this hearing tomorrow is about is really um, getting the kind of momentum, at least in, in Congress, for some potential um, reversal of, of, of Browning-Ferris. And, and I just want to read to you the, the, um, the quote by the chairwoman, chairwoman of this committee prior to the meeting tomorrow, where she says, so many individuals have achieved the American dream by starting and running a small business. 
Unfortunately, the Obama administration and partisan NLRB bureaucrats seem determined to make it harder for small businesses and their employees to succeed, and the job-killing joint employer scheme is a prime example. It is my hope that hearing firsthand accounts of the damage caused by the NLRB's overreaching decision will bring this issue the attention it deserves and that it will bring all of us closer to finding a solution for it. So again, the, the hearing is just kind of to bring this issue into the forefront, um, into more the discussion. And I see a question here that says, uh, what's the composition of the NLRB? They are the ones who can reverse um, Brown and Ferris. Is that correct? And luckily for you, my final slide here is about the NLRB nominees. And yes. Um, right now, the board isn't fully uh, comprised, but there are two Republican nominees. Marvin Kaplan, uh, who previously served as Republican Workforce Policy Counsel for the House Education and Workforce Committee, and William Emanuel, who's a partner at Littler and has traditionally represented business groups. They're expected to be confirmed by August, and once they're confirmed, for the first time in, in a lot of, you know, in, in about 10 years, the NLRB will now be compri comprised of a majority of Republicans. And then it is extremely likely that either Brown and Ferris would be reversed or the board would take on a new similar case um, and rule on that case um, that would essentially serve to, to reverse Brown and Ferris, even if that case isn't specifically reverse, the new case would kind of over, override that case. So you can expect to see some movement a, a, after August, and this will be one of the first things um, I would imagine that a new NLRB would try to be active and, and, and go in reverse. But again, just to reiterate, right this second, Browning Ferris has not been reversed. The only thing that's happened is that the DOL opinion letter has been rescinded, but that opinion letter never really had the full force of law anyway. It was just guidance. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to, to discuss issues relating to independent contractors. <clears throat> so <clears throat> another significant issue to this discussion on employment relationships, particularly in the context of labor and employment, is the classification of workers as independent contractors under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, specifically, the Fair Labor Standards Act provides for certain employee rights that apply to all workers, including um, workers such as temporary workers. <clears throat> for instance, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, or the FLSA, requires that employers pay employees at least a federal minimum wage as well as overtime for any hours worked in excess of 40 hours per week. The Fair Labor Standards Act, however, allows for an exception to these requirements for workers that are properly classified as independent contractors. But in implement, implementing <clears throat> this exception, employers do run the risk of misclassifying workers as independent contractors particularly workers like temporary workers that have a more tenuous relationship with the employer. And proper classification of independent contractors is really important because if wrongly classified, um, an, a worker could have a significant claim for lost wages or overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act, as well as other damages provided for in the act. And this is particularly significant when more than one worker um, claims that they have been misclassified or has been misclassified, uh, this could be potentially quite costly to the employer. This is also really important because addressing misclassification of independent contractors has actually been a priority at the Department of Labor, and this is demonstrated through its misclassification initiatives. Under the misclassification initiative, the Department of Labor and the IRS have been working together and sharing information to investigate and reduce incidents of misclassification of workers as independent contractors versus employees. 
Additionally, the Department of Labor has um, agreement with 37 state agencies, which have signed memorandums of understanding with the Department of Labor. And pursuant to these memorandums um, and these agreements between these state agencies and the Department of Labor, the state agencies share information regarding independent contractor misclassification in the states with the DOL so that they can establish um, a broader enforcement effort nationwide. Um, the states that have made these agreements usually do receive some level of federal funding to improve their own misclassification detection as well as their enforcement efforts at the state level on the ground, you know, actually going to employer sites and assessing the classification of workers as independent contractors. Um, in, fiscal, in the fiscal year 2018 budget, the Trump administration has allocated approximately uh, $230 million for the wage and hour division, which is actually a slight increase from uh, fiscal year 2017. Um, based on the DOL's uh, supporting documentation for its proposed budget, it is unclear uh, exactly what percentage of those funds will go toward their enforcement efforts, particularly um, enforcement efforts on this misclassification front. But in the budget justification documentation, the Department of Labor, or DOL, uh, continues to emphasize its intent to enforce the laws against misclassification of independent contractors. Interestingly, um, the supporting documentation also emphasizes compliance assistance resources. Uh, so compliance assistance, you know, putting out guidance that uh, helps employers understand how to classify independent contractors um, accurately might be another manner in which these funds are allocated um, and used by the Department of Labor. The Trump administration, both generally and in its budget, has actually emphasized increased compliance assistance for, for employers, as opposed to just largely using enforcement efforts um, to hold employers accountable for properly classifying independent contractors. So in evaluating whether a worker is an independent contractor, there are actually several different tests that have been used, um, including tests developed by the IRS, by the Supreme Court, and a lot of state laws um, have also developed their own tests for assessing independent contractors. But generally, the factors considered in each of these tests are all very similar. We're going to focus today um, on the wage and hour division's assessment of uh, how to classify an independent contractor. And the Wage and Hour Division's goal is to determine whether the worker is economically dependent on the employer, uh, similar to what Jordan referred to um, in his discussion on joint employment. If the worker is economically dependent on the employer, then that worker should be classified as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. Um, one of the important factors considered uh, is the level of control that an employer exerts over uh, the particular worker in assessing whether they should be considered an, an independent contractor, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But the test does have multiple elements that all must be evaluated and weighed to make an accurate determination of whether the worker should be considered an independent contractor or an employee. So this slide shows the main factors that have been identified by the Department of Labor as those generally considered in determining whether an employment relationship exists under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, so the first factor here is the employer's nature and degree of control over the worker. So this factor addresses who sets the worker's pay and the number of hours, who determines how the work will be performed, uh, and whether the worker is actually free to work for other companies while they're also performing tasks for this particular uh, employer. An independent contractor must control the meaningful aspects of the work relationship. Uh, generally, if an employer dictates how and when the work should be performed, the worker is more likely to be classified as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. The second factor here is the extent the work performed is integral to the employer's business. So if the work performed by a worker is integral to the employer's business operations, then the worker is more likely 
to be considered economically dependent on the employer and not really in business for themselves. And in that scenario, they would be more likely to be classified as an employee. Uh, for example, if the employer is a large retailer, a worker who sells the retailer's product is going to be more likely to be considered an employee, whereas a worker hired to repaint, repaint a particular store location or to rewire some lights in a store, um, that person is more likely to be considered an independent contractor because the work they're performing is important to you know, how the business runs and whether the business can run, but it's not integral to the employer's business operations. Uh, the third factor is the permanency of the employment relationship. So a short defined relationship would suggest um, an independent contractor status, while a more permanent or indefinite employment relationship uh, tends to support that the worker should be considered an employee. Next, uh, the worker's investment in equipment and facilities. So an independent contractor should have a business investment in the work and the equipment that's used to perform the task for which um, that individual was hired so that the worker shares in the risk of loss with the employer. Uh, providing his own equipment to perform the work would support independent contractor status, but that doesn't necessarily prove that the worker is definitely an independent contractor. For instance, if the employer reimburses the worker for the purchase of equipment um, or tools necessary to complete the task for which they were hired, this would be more likely to you know, give them employee status. Then the fifth factor is the worker's opportunity for profit or loss. Um, this factor focuses on whether the worker exercises managerial skills, um, an independent initiative and judgment on the job that would affect their ability um, for profit or loss. If the worker can earn a profit by working more efficiently, um, or they could suffer a loss by working inefficiently, then the worker is more likely to be considered an independent contractor. And then finally, um, the DOL will consider the level of skill, initiative, and independent judgment used by the worker. Um, if the worker skills demonstrate that he or she exercises independent business judgment, and the worker takes initiative to operate as an independent business and be competitive in the marketplace in which they're working, um, then they're more likely to be considered an independent contractor. Um, specifically, employers should not have to provide skills training to an independent contractor uh, when they're hired to perform a certain task. An independent contractor should already have the skill necessary to perform that task um, or of their own you know, accord and decision, decide to go get training to obtain that specific skill. Um, as long as it's not being provided by the employer, then it's more likely to support independent contractor status. So all of these factors have to be considered together to make a determination of whether a worker should be considered an independent contractor or an employee. Um, the DOL may disagree with the employer's evaluation of these factors, uh, but, you know, performing this evaluation, documenting this evaluation uh, supports that the employer has carefully considered the classification of this worker and can support an employer's position if that classification is ever questioned. And then here we have some recommendations um, that you can use to help uh, ensure that a worker has been properly classified and is being treated properly as an independent contractor or an employee. Um, first, we do recommend memorializing an independent contractor relationship in a contract. Um, although courts have still found an employment relationship despite the party's execution of an independent contractor agreement, um, you know, having the contract in place does support the um, independent contractor relationship. It also defines the relationship in a way that can, you know, support the employer's determination that this worker is an independent contractor. These types of agreements should be signed by both the organization and the independent contractor, and it should include specific acknowledgement that the independent contractor is not actually an employee. 
Um, we also suggest establishing policies to, to limit direct control of independent contractors. Management employees of a company should not provide direct control over independent contractors. And it's important to make sure that managers are trained on how they should interact with in independent contractors, um, as well as to make sure they're aware of the policies that limit their control and supervision over independent contractors. Um, you know, like I talked about in the last slide, to support an independent contractor relationship, you do want to have um, a term of the relationship that is relatively limited in, in duration and is specifically defined. And a good place to define um, the term of the relationship is in that independent contractor agreement. Um, you want to limit the interaction between employees and independent contractors. Make sure there is an obvious um, you know, difference between how employees and independent contractors are treated. Um, and this can be minimized by doing separate trainings, having separate communications, and things that need to be communicated to both employees and independent contractors should be communicated in separate correspondence. Um, and then exclusion of independent contractors from social events uh, that might be put together for the benefit of employees. An independent contractor should also not be provided an employee handbook or other policies that are specific to employees. And then finally, um, employers want to make sure that they're reviewing vacation, sick leave, and other paid leave policies that should really just be applicable to employees to make sure that uh, it's clear that the policies don't cover independent contractors. Uh, benefit plans are another um, area that employers should review, make sure it's clear that benefit plans just cover uh, their full-time you know, permanent employees as opposed to independent contractors. Finally, um, although we aren't very far into the Trump administration, um, and the new Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta, was just confirmed in April, it does appear that the, minute, the, the administration is already pulling back um, on the expansive definition of who is an employee versus an independent contractor that had been promoted by the prior administration. Um, similar to what Jordan had discussed in the context of um, the joint employer guidance put out by the Department of Labor, uh, back in July 2015, the Wage and Hour Division published an administrator's interpretation uh, that, ex that talked about independent contractors and then explained the analysis that should be used in evaluating independent contractor status. And that analysis um, was pretty similar to what had already um, been pushed you know, forward guidance-wise by the Department of Labor. But uh, the significance of this interpretation was really in the conclusion uh, that the broad definitions provided in the Fair Labor Standards Act, particularly for the term employ, meant that most workers should be treated as employees and should be classified as employees. And this interpretation kind of created a presumption that workers should generally be classified as employees. However, Similar, to, uh, at the same time, actually, as the um, joint employer guidance, um, Acosta also withdrew this interpretation related to independent contractors in June 2017. Uh, the press release that went along with the, re with the withdrawal of this guidance uh, did point out that this doesn't change the employer's legal responsibilities, but it does indicate um, that there is a potential for a narrower interpretation of um, terms like employ under the Fair Labor Standards Act that may make it you know, less of a presumption that a worker should be classified as an employee versus an independent contractor. Um, as Jordan stated, this is just kind of a first step uh, for the administration, and we still kind of have to wait and see you know, how they proceed from here and whether there is um, more initiative taken in narrowing um, the interpretations of the prior administration. Uh, but this is a first step in that direction, so we'll have to um, see what else they come out with. Uh, I will now turn it over to Eric to talk about OSHA's temporary worker initiative. Thank you. Yes, yeah, this, uh, this discussion really is uh, 
just a continuation or you know really a, a, a an impact of some of the discussions that Jordan and Lindsay have talked about already. It's a, a specific worker-employer relationship that OSHA is paying a lot of attention to, and a lot of the analysis that Jordan and Lindsay have shared already today uh, uh, weigh in or impact um, you know, what it is that OSHA is doing in this area and why. So the first question uh, that I asked when I saw that, that OSHA had initiated a temporary worker initiative a couple of years ago is why. Why is this a particular um, workplace relationship uh, that OSHA is interested in? Uh, and the folks that I know at the agency and some of their public statements about this and some of the things that you'll find written on OSHA's website that they've released about uh, the temporary worker initiative tells you that they've, uh, they've undertaken this temporary worker initiative um, to address a few uh, principal concerns that the agency has about the use of temporary workers in the workplace. And, and what's on this slide is OSHA's perception, not necessarily reality, and uh, I can say personally firsthand that this is not my experience and my observation with the way that my clients work with uh, temporary workers, but this is the view that OSHA has espoused about the use of temporary workers and why they felt the need uh, to initiate this initiative. Uh, the first is that OSHA believes that employers, some employers, will use the temporary worker relationship you know, rather than using your own full-time permanent employees, that you'll use a temporary worker who's actually employed by a different entity, a staffing agency most often, to skirt OSHA Act obligations. In other words, these are not my employees, and if they're not my employees, I'm not responsible for training, for, for providing PPE, uh, for addressing physical hazards that might impact them, uh, for reporting or recording uh, injuries that might occur to these workers. So OSHA you know, is taking a hard look at the use of temporary workers because they believe employers are deliberately or uh, deliberately using this work relationship to minimize their potential uh, exposure or their responsibilities or burdens to protect workers from hazards in their workplace. Again, not my personal experience, not what I've observed, but this is what OSHA uh, is saying is the need for this initiative. Uh, another concern that OSHA has is that they believe that temporary workers are often hazardous jobs, the jobs that uh, would hurt morale if uh, permanent full-time employees were asked to do these things. Uh, you know, an example they give often is a, you know, an, a storage tank that needs to be cleaned out once every five years. Rather than having one of your permanent full-time employees do that task, you bring in an outside worker because it's dangerous, it's ugly, and it's unpleasant. No one wants to do it, so let's have a temporary worker do it. And the idea being, again, OSHA is concerned that you're not, the employer is not undertaking uh, the steps needed to protect that worker effectively because it's not their employee and they're asking them to do something that's particularly dangerous. Another concern that OSHA has expressed about the temporary worker uh, a uh, host employer relationship is that the temporary workers tend to be more vulnerable, um, more vulnerable to hazards and in particular more vulnerable to retaliation because of their tenuous relationship uh, to the workplace. They are very much easier to replace than a permanent full-time employee, less costly to replace uh, often, uh, and they know that their, you know, their tenure at the workplace is, um, is not as secure. And so they are less likely to you know, raise safety and health concerns to the employer, uh, less likely to point out unsafe conditions, less likely to refuse to undertake a task because it is unsafe or they don't feel like they've been provided uh, the right tools or the right training. And so they are vulnerable to this retaliation for speaking out uh, means that they are more likely to be put in dangerous situations uh, or to not point out dangerous situations. Um, and then all of that sort of rolls up to the concept of, that OSHA has that someone in these short-term, non-permanent, non-full-time uh, relationships um, are not likely to be given by the host employer sufficient safety training. They're not likely to be advised what hazards are present in the workplace, how to address them, and explain how to do their jobs in a safe way by the host employer because the host employer 
is trying to avoid making that substantial investment in, um, uh, in training someone who's not going to be there long term and not given sufficient training by the staffing agency because the staffing agency really can't provide sufficient training because they don't know uh, that the site-specific hazards um, uh, and the tasks that the worker may perform at the host employer's workplace. They're not in as good a position. So these people are vulnerable to safety and health hazards because of that relationship. Uh, OSHA has pointed out, uh, as they've rolled out this initiative over the last couple of years, the, um, what I observe to be anecdotal, uh, although OSHA talks about it uh, sort of as an objective data-driven uh, issue, but it seems to be more anecdotal, that temporary workers tend to experience higher rates of fatalities and other serious injuries on day one, a day one in quotes there being, in the first few days on a new job. Uh, because of this supposed inadequate training, um, uh, the temporary workers are more vulnerable to experience than permanent full-time employees. I think you also have the idea that a temporary worker through a staffing agency may have a lot more day one on a new job uh, than other employees because they bounce around, they move to different workplaces uh, when staffing needs arise. So there's greater potential to have those day one types of incidents. But OSHA has highlighted a handful of really uh, gruesome, unfortunate uh, incidents involving temporary workers that seem to um, you know, uh, illustrate these concerns that they have raised, and that is why they have initiated this temporary worker initiative. Finally, uh, they, they believe, the federal government believes, that there, and there's a, some objective data to support this, that there is an increasing use of temporary workers in America's workforce. And there's two um, uh, primary explanations for that. The first is, as the uh, economy moved slowly out of recession, employers were um, more conservative about making permanent full-time hiring decisions uh, and waiting to see if the increased demand for goods and services that they were seeing uh, was going to be permanent and long-term. So they would use staffing agency supplemental uh, workers to address an increase in uh, demand for goods and services without making a commitment to permanent full-time uh, hiring. The other uh, major factor in the increase in the use of temporary workers was the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, as it was being implemented, uh, put uh, requirements on employers of certain sizes. Uh, to either provide health coverage, to provide a certain quality of health coverage, uh, or to, to pay certain fees and taxes. And so the triggers for those different requirements were size of the workforce. And so if you could avoid moving into the next category size of uh, employer by using part-time, temporary, uh, staffing agency um, uh, work relationships rather than increasing your actual full-time employment, you might avoid some of those obligations. And, and uh, government observed that when Romney Care was rolled out in Massachusetts, the rate and use of uh, temporary workers increased by um, uh, six times faster in Massachusetts than it did in the rest of the country. So the expectation is that, that would, uh, we would see the same uh, sort of evolution um, in the rest of the country as the Affordable Care Act uh, rolled out. So that's why OSHA has taken a hard look at temporary workers. What is it exactly that they're doing? Their initiative, although temporary worker can mean lots of different things, this particular initiative is focused only on the, um, uh, uh, the workers who are supplied by a staffing agency to a host employer. Um, and that's not to say that OSHA wouldn't apply some of the principles that we'll talk about uh, in other workplace relationships, but this specific initiative is taking a hard look at those types of workplace relationships. And the goals of the initiative are, are you know, as you would expect from OSHA, it's to protect those workers that they're looking at, protect temporary workers from unique workplace hazards, to ensure that staffing agencies and host employers understand their relative and sometimes joint obligations to protect the safety and health of these temporary workers, um, and then to, to gather information. It's sort of a three-pronged initiative. Right now, they're still in the information gathering mode where they're trying to understand what industries and types of workplaces use temporary workers, what they use temporary workers for, uh, how they utilize them, the different structures 
that you might see within staffing agencies and the different types of contractual relationships that you might see between staffing agencies and host employers to try to understand where the, where the greatest hazards are and where I believe to later put particular targeted enforcement resources. Uh, that has been my expectation and my advice to my clients is that right now, although OSHA is doing something in the enforcement realm in temporary worker initiatives that we'll talk about, my expectation is that's going to expand, or at least it had been my expectation that that would expand and get very focused, either with the um, launch of a national uh, or regional emphasis programs on temporary worker safety, or to just add temporary worker safety issues to existing national and regional emphasis programs. For example, if they observed in the grain industry that there was a heavy use of temporary workers, um, in particular temporary workers that uh, do not speak English uh, as their primary language and are vulnerable to inadequate training and seem to be getting hurt at a higher rate uh, than permanent full-time employees, that OSHA might add as a component to the existing regional emphasis enforcement programs in the grain industry, a temporary worker safety focus to that program or just its own program. Now, of course, with the Trump administration moving generally in a different direction than the Obama administration in terms of how the agency will use its resources, it, it perhaps has become less likely uh, that OSHA will initiate a new emphasis program on this issue or, or adapt existing emphasis programs. But I don't think that we're going to see this focus on temporary workers disappear or contract uh, because of the Trump administration. This is not a, um, a partisan issue. I do think that you'll see a different treatment in um, who's responsible, which employer is responsible, and when these relationships exist with staffing agencies, how far the Department of Labor and OSHA are willing to go to say that it's a joint employer relationship is established. But I do think there'll be a continued effort to look at this issue, educate on this issue, compliance assistance uh, on this issue, and enforce, uh, although perhaps not as uh, significantly as we might have seen um, in a subsequent Democratic administration. So under the initiative so far, what we're seeing is that OSHA has instructed and directed their compliance, safety, and health officers. Uh, these are the boots on the ground inspectors that come in and conduct workplace inspections uh, in essentially every inspection, regardless of whether it's an incident, accident, employee complaint, relating in any way to temporary workers. Compliance officers are supposed to, in all inspections, look for the presence of temporary workers at a workplace to determine whether temporary workers are being used and then to identify whether there are unique hazards that temporary workers are being exposed to in the workplace by virtue of their status as a temporary worker or staffing agency uh, worker. And then they're to gather information um, to determine you know, who's the staffing agency, the location, the supervising structure, the contractual relationship, again, that this is the information gathering part of the initiative uh, to be used later for some purpose, presumably for enforcement. Uh, identify whether there's training is being provided either by the host or the staffing agency in a language that the workers can understand. Um, and then do an assessment uh, of the issue that uh, the, you know, both Jordan and Lindsay have talked about today as to whether that those workers, however they might be characterized by the host employer as independent contractors, staffing agency workers, non-employees, do an assessment to determine whether they are in fact employees of the host employer. Uh, and they do that using you know, a, a set of factors and an analysis that's very similar to what Jordan has already talked about. So I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I just want to highlight the factors that the OSH Review Commission has pointed to as the most significant in that analysis. And the ultimate question is, does the host employer have the right to control the manner and means by which the work is being accomplished? And that question is answered by looking at a set of factors that uh, I think both uh, Lindsay and Jordan have both talked about today. Um, you know, location of the work and the duration of the relationship that's happening at your workplace over an extended period of time, much more likely to be found to be your employee. Uh, the skill required, if it's a special skill that you have brought, you have brought in a specialty contractor or a specialty worker 
to perform this task over a short period of time. Uh, it's less likely they'll be considered your employee, but if it's a, uh, a low-skill uh, labor uh, activity that's integral to the work that's being done at your workplace, much more likely to be considered uh, your employee. Who's providing the tools uh, and, the safety, um, and the safety systems for the work to be done, the personal protective equipment, the actual operational tools and equipment that's being used, uh, work clothing, um, you know, if it's a flame retardant clothing or pr uh, clothing that will protect you from bloodborne uh, pathogens exposures, if the host is providing that equipment and those tools, much more likely that they'll be found to be the employer. And then do, does the host employer have the ability and the right to assign additional projects? You know, you've, you've contracted with a staffing agency to have this person come in and do word processing, uh, but while they're there, the supervisor of the host employer walks in and says, I need you to carry these boxes uh, into storage. You know, that's a new task, a new assignment that you, the host employer, are directing much more likely to be considered the employer for this temporary worker. Um, so you get the analysis, and ultimately uh, what OSHA has said under the Obama administration, which may change, again, they may pull back some of this, is that in most cases there's going to be found joint responsibility from a safety and health standpoint, that both the host employer and the staffing agency will have responsibilities uh, under the OSHA Act and OSHA's regulation. Host employers, this is a quote from David Michaels, the longest tenured um, uh, OSHA administrator uh, during the Obama, was basically the head of OSHA for almost Obama's entire presidency. Uh, here he is talking about the temporary worker initiative saying that host employers need to treat temp workers as they treat existing employees. Staffing agencies and host employers share control over the employee and therefore joint, are jointly responsible uh, for the temporary employee's safety. It's essential that both employers comply with the relevant OSHA requirements. So that's the idea under the Obama administration. The expectation is that both the host and the staffing agency will uh, be responsible and therefore could be cited for not complying with, the, um, uh, with various OSHA regulations. So far, OSHA has issued quite a bit of guidance. If you go on OSHA's website, OSHA.gov, under temporary workers, uh, you'll see a bunch of uh, fact pages and, and guides um, uh, that OSHA has issued in various areas of, uh, respond, uh, of you know, OSHA regulatory requirements and opined about which employer between the host and the staffing agency is likely to be found responsible uh, either to, to carry out the task or cited when that, uh, when that task um, or compliance activity is not followed. Uh, ge generally speaking, sort of at a generic level, safety training, OSHA says uh, that the larger responsibility for training falls on the employer who exercises day-to-day -day super supervision. Um, and, you know, that means if you, like I said, you have your frontline supervisors are giving assignments and overseeing the work that's being done, OSHA's expectation is that the host is going to be largely responsible for all of the safety training. Um, but it, it's a joint, a joint mission. Uh, the staffing agency, at the very least, will have high-level generic safety training requirements, and the host will have site-specific hazard-specific training requirements. Uh, and then they get into a little bit more detail under some specific, um, uh, specific standards. And one that they've spent a good amount of time um, educating on is hazard communication, OSHA's chemical right to know standard. Uh, and in this circumstance, what OSHA says will be the typical expectation is that the staffing agency is responsible for generic high-level hazard communication standard training, meaning training on what hazard communication is, training on how to read a safety data sheet, you know, SDSs they're called now under the new HASCOM standard, used to be MSDSs, uh, that, that the staffing agency, because they are the, you know, um, institutional employer of the employee, uh, of the temporary worker, has to train you how to read an SDS. What are the sections of the SDS? Where do you find the hazard information and how you treat an exposure to, 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 to the chemical, although not talking about specific chemicals or specific categories of chemicals. Similarly with labels, how to read a label on a chemical 
container what the new symbols on the labels mean. But the specific training, training on the specific categories of chemical hazards that might be present uh, in a workplace, OSHA has opined that the typical situation will be that the host employer is responsible for that specific level training. What chemicals are present in the workplace, where, you know, how to uh, manage exposures to those chemicals like um, you know, where your eyewash stations are, where your safety showers are, what PPE should be worn specifically for handling or working around certain chemicals. And the idea, OSHA says, is look, the host employer is in a much better position to know what hazards are present, what chemicals are present, and how to address um, exposures to those chemicals. So that's why that um, responsibility will fall primarily to them. Um, the last area where OSHA has offered um, uh, some guidance and one I wanted to spend a little bit of time with because of uh, uh, related regulatory uh, issues going on right now is the injury and illness record keeping. And this we've always viewed as a very big deal in the context of temporary workers because you know, in large part, employers are you know, working through temporary um, uh, uh, staffing agencies because they're not bringing someone in as a full-time employee. Their expectation is that injuries to those workers, because they're not my employees, don't go on my log. And that's a big deal as we watch the sort of start and go, start and stop um, rollout of the electronic record-keeping rule. And hopefully uh, you all know by now, if you don't, I'll tell you that the July 1st deadline, which has already passed, uh, for the first instance to deliver to OSHA um, your injury and illness data electronically under the new e-record-keeping rule was delayed by OSHA. It was delayed till December, at least till December so that OSHA can reevaluate the rule under the new administration and determine whether they intend to carry out the rule at all, whether they intend to amend the rule or to implement it just as it's written. Uh, so right now we're not submitting that data. There's a good chance in the future we will uh, at least some portion of the data. So it's important to understand, hey, do I have to record the injuries of these temporary workers? They're not on my payroll. Uh, they're not uh, technically my employee. Is it my responsibility to record that uh, injury and therefore submit it to OSHA when I do have to submit my injury data? Well, the analysis that OSHA has provided, um, and I agree with this based on the way the standard is written, is that whichever of those employers, the staffing agency or the host employer, supervises the day-to-day -day work of that temporary worker, that is the employer who is responsible for all of the uh, obligations under 1904, the record keeping and reporting. So that means if your supervisors are giving assignments, you're providing the PPE, uh, you're directing their work activity, you can stop their work. If you're dissatisfied with it or you see something unsafe, you're supervising them on a day-to-day -day basis. You're responsible to record their injuries on your 300 log, make out the 301 incident report, uh, include that data on your 300 annual, 300A annual summary, submit the data to OSHA if we get to that point in the electronic rulemaking, and if it is a reportable hospitalization, amputation, or fatality, that you as the host employer are the one responsible to make that report to OSHA. So I just want to move to a couple of best practices here that I've sort of been advising my clients um, yeah, to uh, you know, manage this temporary worker issue knowing that OSHA is looking so closely at it. Uh, just as uh, Lindsay uh, identified as a best practice in sort of fleshing out that independent contractor relationship, I would say the same thing in this context is have a careful and thoughtful contract with the staffing agency. The contract will not be the end-all, be-all. OSHA may look at how things are implemented in the field, but if you document carefully in your contract who's responsible for which uh, safety and health um, uh, you know, uh, uh, regulatory obligations, who is the day-to-day -day employer, uh, who has day-to-day -day supervision requirements, who shall supply PPE, who shall provide training, and you're pushing that back onto the staffing agency, that is very helpful evidence in the analysis that will be done as to whether this is your employee and whether you have the responsibility under the OSH Act to carry out those things. Or write in the contract that you do have those responsibilities if you want to own them um, and want to make sure that they're being done right because you don't trust that the staffing agency is going to do it, understanding that OSHA is looking at this 
as a joint responsibility situation, you might be better off just owning it and taking those items yourself. Uh, but in addition to being evidence in a dispute about whether someone's your employer, it also helps avoid things falling through the cracks. If it's clearly laid out in a contract, responsible for which types of training, providing which types of equipment, providing which types of supervision, it's more likely to happen the way that the two parties expect and to go more smoothly. Uh, I recommend that regardless of whether you are owning uh, that, that responsibility or not, uh, that you do conduct a site orientation, some site-specific, hazard-specific training for any new worker uh, on your site because OSHA is going to expect that and if you can say, look, we did the site-specific piece while expecting the staffing agency to do you know, everything else, you'll be in a much better position uh, and, and you'll be able to you know, better prepare workers for work at your workplace. Maintain open communications with temporary workers. That's important um, in all the aspects we talked about from you know, hearing about safety and health concerns, training, record keeping. Uh, it's sometimes hard to get all the information you need to uh, complete uh, your record keeping responsibilities because these are not workers who are coming back uh, to your workplace. Um, so, you know, you'll want to maintain open communications with the staffing agency and the temporary workers. Um, identify unique hazards that temporary workers may be exposed to. Um, you know, don't rely on staffing agencies to do that. If you're bringing in a temporary worker to do a special project that's not something that's ordinarily on your radar screen, uh, undertake the effort to assess the hazard of that task or that uh, unique activity um, so that you can communicate that to the staffing agency and or the, the temporary worker. Do an assessment of whether this person is going to be considered your employee. Knowing the factors that the Review Commission looks at and that OSHA is going to look at and that Jordan and, and Lindsay and I talked about today and look at it and say, okay, I know I've been calling this, this group of workers, temporary workers, not employees um, uh, for the last couple of years. Let's actually do an assessment and make sure we're right about that uh, and, and determine whether OSHA is likely to agree with that um, and perhaps change some of the ways you manage those workers or manage safety and health based on that assessment. And review your policies, procedures, and training documents. Uh, that's always a good, um, a, a good idea, um, regardless of whether you're dealing with temporary workers or per permanent uh, uh, full-time employees. Um, I, I see a couple of questions here. I'll try to address a couple of these, then let Lindsay bring it home, talking about the multi-employer worksite enforcement policy. Um, uh, a couple of these look like I addressed through the, the, the course of the slides. One is the time period when the um, electronic rec reporting is expected to kick in. I believe that's December 1st is the new deadline, but I am, uh, have on pretty good authority that OSHA is um, uh, digging deep into this rule and assessing whether they're going to implement it um, at all or, or with some changes. So I'm not sure that December 1st date is going to hold. Um, and even if it does, there, there's going to be some, I expect, some significant differences in what the rule actually requires. So I'd recommend, you know, checking out our blog to stay up to date on that, or I'm sure we'll have another webinar on that topic uh, later. I'm going to let Lindsay take over. I'm going to look at some of these questions, and maybe we'll chime in at the end um, with, um, uh, with some comments on those. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I know there was a couple, I think, questions related to the independent contractor discussion too. Um, so with the remaining time that we have after we finish up here, we'll try to address more of those questions. So we'll just spend this uh, last chunk of time here going through OSHA's multi-employer worksite enforcement policy. Basically, a multi-employer worksite exists where there are two or more employers working at the same worksite toward a common goal or for a common project. Um, in these circumstances, more than one employer may actually be cited by OSHA if a hazardous condition is discovered, depending on the employer's role in the work site. Uh, specifically, whether and what manner the employer may be decided or may be cited by OSHA is, like I said, the specific role that they play on the site, the responsibilities that they have on the site, as well as their actual as what, excuse me, sorry, as well as whether the employer is actually meeting its obligations based on that uh, designated role or responsibility. And we'll go through each of those roles uh, briefly and kind of when and how the employer is responsible based on that role. So OSHA 
uh, specifies four different roles that an, that an employer can play on a multi-employer worksite. Uh, the first role is the creating employer, and this is kind of self-explanatory, uh, but the creating employer is the one that creates or causes a hazard. So for example, an employer that damages a raised platform guardrail while ho hoisting um, a piece of scaffold, for instance, would be the creating employer because that employer has generated the hazardous condition to which employees may now be exposed. The creating employer can be cited um, for the creation of a non-compliant condition where it does nothing to address that condition um, and this holds true even where its own employees aren't actually exposed to the condition. And this kind of flows into the next category of employer, which is the exposing employer. And an exposing employer is the one whose employees are actually exposed to the hazardous condition. Um, in the example I just described, um, the exposing employer would be the one whose employees are up you know, on that platform working by that guardrail and are now exposed to the hazardous condition created by the damaged guardrail. So the, expose, the exposing employer can be cited if that employer has knowledge that its employees are being exposed to a hazardous condition um, and if it has the ability to address the condition itself, it would have a responsibility to do so. However, if it doesn't have the ability to actually be able to fix the condition itself, it does have to meet these three other requirements, which is to act within the authority that it does have to address the hazard, um, ask the creating or controlling employer to fix the hazard to which its employees are exposed, and then finally, it also has to inform its own employees of the hazard and make sure that its employees are working in conditions that um, are not actually you know, creating an issue of safety. Um, if the employer that damaged the guardrail is also the employer whose employees are up on that platform and working by that guardrail, then this one employer could actually be considered both the creating and exposing employer and would have the obligations that I just discussed um, based on those categorizations. Uh, the third category is the correcting employer. <clears throat> and the correcting employer is the one that's responsible for actually correcting any sort of hazardous condition that arises. Um, you know, going back to my example, this could be the carpentry contractor who was hired to erect and maintain the guardrails um, at this particular work site and then would also be responsible for repairing any damage to the guardrails. The creating employer can be cited under OSHA's multi-employer work site policy if that employer does not exercise reasonable care and finding and repairing the hazardous conditions um, within their designated responsibilities. Uh, and then finally, you have um, the controlling employer. And the controlling employer will usually be uh, the general contractor on site, the one who has general supervisory authority over the work site. The extent of the measures that the controlling employer has to implement to satisfy its duty of reasonable care um, under the multi-employer policy is less than what would be required for an employer with you know, respect to protecting their own employees. Uh, for instance, a controlling employer is not normally required to inspect for hazards as frequently as you know, employers in these other categories. Um, but the reasonable care asserted by uh, the controlling employer will be assessed and evaluated based on multiple factors. Uh, for instance, OSHA will look at the scale of the particular project, uh, the nature and pace of the work that's being performed at the work site, as well as how much the employer knows about the safety his history of the other employers on site um, and the safety expertise of the other employers on site. Um, if the controlling employer knows that um, other employers on site have a history of noncompliance, you know, that maybe they've had other um, OSHA citations for safety violations in the past, then the controlling employer would have to exert greater oversight of that particular employer. Alternatively, 
if the controlling employer knows that um, another employer on site has a really strong uh, safety record, you know, um, has a lot of expertise in safety, then the controlling employer would be required to exert less oversight over that particular employer. Um, they would have a decreased obligation in that uh, particular circumstance. So to determine a particular employer's obligations under this framework, OSHA is just going to look at the responsibilities of the employer on the work site, you know, what role that particular employer plays, um, you know, what task that, to which that employer and its employees have been assigned to determine what category um, it would fit into. Um, as discussed prior, one employer may meet more than one role, such as an exposing and creating employer. Um, this could be the case with other roles as well. But notably, under the policy, compliance officers are instructed by OSHA to first determine whether the employer, whether a particular employer is an exposing employer before evaluating the other categories, which makes sense. Um, you know, the exposing employer, their employees are the ones exposed to the hazard. You know, this is the normal framework under which OSHA operates and evaluates um, different work sites. So it follows that the compliance officer should first determine whether the employer's employees are exposed to whatever hazardous condition is discovered. And if not, um, or even if they are, you know, then evaluate whether the employer plays any other role on the site for which it might have some sort of safety obligation to the workers, even if those workers are not their own employees. Um, and just to note here, in a recent case uh, called Hensel Phelps Construction Company, an administrative law judge established a potential limitation to the multi-employer framework um, that has been you know, used by OSHA and has also been supported by the Occupational Safety and Health Commission um, in, in some of its precedent. So the facts of this case are that Hensel Phelps, uh, the company at issue here, was cited back in 2015 for permitting uh, subcontractor employees to perform work in an unprotected excavation um, at a work site at which it was the controlling employer. Um, however, in response to the citation, Hensel Phelps asserted that based on Fifth Circuit case law, it could not actually be held liable for this violation as a general contractor because its own employees weren't actually exposed to the condition. And it made this argument despite the commission precedent that does you know, support the multi-employer policy. So in evaluating the case, the judge in this instance determined that yes, um, Hensel Phelps did meet the elements of a controlling employer. Um, it had you know, management authority at the site and it had the ability to stop work if any hazardous conditions were discovered and it actually had stopped work um, in prior instances where um, some safety concerns were raised. And it also removed certain uh, subcontractors from the job site related to safety issues. It was also undisputed by the parties that Hemsdale Self Management was present when the employees were in the unprotected excavation and that they knew that the employees were there. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, everyone, I have a little bit of a cold that I'm fighting. <clears throat> okay. Um, however, this particular job site was in Texas, which is within the jurisdiction of the Fifth Circuit. And the Fifth Circuit had ruled that an employer could not be held responsible for exposure of workers to a hazard if the workers were not its own employees. <coughs> you want me to? <laughs> so the, the gist here is that uh, the, the judge in this case said the review commission takes, has taken historically a different view on this issue, um, but because this case is appealable to the Fifth Circuit, the judge turned to Fifth Circuit precedent that said basically the multi-employer policy is unlawful that the OSH Act itself applies only to an employer's own employees. And so 
another employer whose own employees are not exposed to a hazard can't be cited uh, uh, in those circumstances. So we, we highlight this case because it just happened. It's really interesting, and it shows that the Review Commission is willing to stick with um, a circuit court decision, even if it's contrary to uh, the Review Commission's general precedent, but also because we've moved into this new administration that may look to opportunities like this to narrow the application of the multi-employer uh, enforcement framework. I've not heard or seen anything to suggest that that's going to happen. Um, you know, in fact, we don't have a, an assistant secretary of labor for OSHA uh, or a deputy assistant or a chief of staff or any political appointees at OSHA, so it's too early to predict what issues they might seize on and try and change the, the shape of, but this is one that, you know, there's big segments of industry uh, that, that either don't like the multi-employer policy at all or feel like it's been abused by OSHA uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, so this case is significant in that it you know, highlights an opportunity, a reasonable interpretation of the OSHA Act um, that the Fifth Circuit has adopted could become a national interpretation if OSHA under the Trump administration wanted to take it that way. So an interesting issue there um, that we thought we would end on. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to check out our blogs, especially as we are in this critical period with the new administration uh, that is starting to, to make significant changes at OSHA uh, and, and the Department of Labor generally. Check out our blogs, the OSHA Defense Report and the Employer Defense Report. Um, there would be great, uh, great ways to keep up with some of those uh, changing um, uh, uh, laws, regulations, and policies. Uh, we also have, as you know, because you're here today, the webinar series, the Employer Defense Report webinar series, and the OSHA Defense Report webinar series. We hope you can join us for the rest of our free monthly webinars that we do on labor and employment topics and OSHA topics. Um, and we've kept you for an awful long time today. I do see that there's a couple of questions here, but my plan will be to address those with some follow-up emails to everybody uh, so that we don't take up your entire afternoon. I really do appreciate you joining us today. This was a really interesting topic, and I was really pleased to be joined uh, by my partners in the employment practice where there is this really uh, interesting overlap um, in, in the law in the areas we practice, and we were glad to be able uh, to do this with you all together today. So thanks again, and uh, we look forward to you joining us for uh, future webinars.